All right, we are back and uh, very pleased to be joined by Rick Weiland, who uh, you will know as uh, one of the top Democrats in this state and uh, he has been uh, very active recently uh, with his TakeItBack.org campaign, uh, which has a pretty ambitious uh, uh, worldview in that we need to sort of uh, tear up the political process and start from scratch, at least here in South Dakota to a certain extent, and, and maybe uh, maybe that catches hold and goes national. And, and Rick, uh, I know you said before we went on that you don't, you're not officially running for office, so you can speak freely. Not that you didn't before, but uh, <laughs> this seems like to, to have energized you uh, to a certain extent, you know, going through the ballot initiative process and, and trying to, to fix some things that maybe came to light for you during the uh, during the actual election process. No, that's that's absolutely right. I mean, election night obviously was a disappointment a couple of years ago, um, having been to every town in South Dakota and worked for almost two years to get out there and talk to people and share ideas and listen and learn. But, you know, election night, one thing happened. Uh, the state of South Dakota decided to increase the minimum wage. 55% uh, of the people that... Uh, you know, voted for it, they decided that, you know, they'd had enough of peer not moving on the issue and it got on the ballot, which I helped, uh, our campaign helped get the, the signatures to get it on the ballot and it passed 55-45 and so, you know, after the election, we're sitting down with a good friend of mine, Dre Samuelson, who you may know, uh, Dre served uh, with distinction um, uh, for Tim Johnson for over 28 years as his chief of staff and we've been lifelong friends since the early Dashiell years and uh, we just got together and decided that uh, we just weren't quite ready to pack it, uh, pack it in. Um, and we formed this group called TakeItBack.org, which is a uh, C3 uh, nonprofit advocacy group. And, uh, and we've been focused on using uh, ballot initiatives here in South Dakota to drive uh, political reform. Uh, South Dakota is one of 24 states in the country that allows some form of referendum or, or initiative. Um, and a matter of fact, uh, and I didn't know this at the time, uh, we were the first yeah. in 1898, uh, became part of our constitution and other states began to follow. So, you know, with the backdrop of the minimum wage passing, when Pierre couldn't get it done, when Washington can't get it done, um, and the voters in South Dakota got it done, we thought, well, maybe there's some other things that we can put in front of the voters that uh, they'll be supportive of. And we've come up with a number of different things. There are so many... I think opportunities to use that kind of uh, direct democracy to uh, you know end run the sort of traditional uh, system, if you will, the establishment, the political establishment, which I'm sure we'll talk about today, mm -hmm. um, you know, to drive uh, what I think are really good reforms, and they're not blue or red. Um, they're problems uh, in blue states and red states. Uh, and I'll take uh, uh, this amendment uh, uh, T, uh, this nonpartisan redistricting, uh, which is on there are the three, ballot. Three, there are actually three. Three pronged approach, right? Okay. A three pronged approach. Let's to break them down. Uh, yeah, why don't we start with, with that one? A three pronged approach to fixing our democracy. One is to make sure we have fair elections. And by that, you know, and I'll, you know, President Obama said it very well in the State of the Union address. He talked about we should let the voters choose the office holders, not the other way around. And uh, when you have legislative districts drawn by the legislature, it becomes a political map, not a, uh, a map based on, on science. So it's a gerrymandering exactly. issue. Exactly, gerrymandering. Uh, ben Franklin warned us of it, uh, you know, 170-some years ago. Well, in gerrymandering itself, when it's shown to be a blatant uh, 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 effort to um, marginalize people, is uh, uh, unconstitutional, but under that very high barrier is a lot of degrees of manipulation. That's exactly right. I'll take my own district. I live in uh, District uh, 13. Prior to the 2010 census, mm -hmm. it was made up uh, in terms of state representatives of Democrats and Republicans. It was pretty balanced. I mean, now I think of the Democrats, Scott Heideprim, Jack Billion, Bill Thompson, Susie Blake, a number of them you know, were successful and got elected and went out and participated, in, you know, in the legislative uh, sessions in Pierre. And then after 2010, and you know what was interesting, prior to 2010, it was about 300 more Republicans than Democrats, mm -hmm. okay? After the census, I think it jumped to about 2,000 more Republicans than Democrats, and all those folks, you know, over a period of time just were obliterated. So we need to, we need to pass uh, Amendment T to take the politics of 
drawing those legislative maps out of the equation and give it to a nonpartisan commission, and that's what it would do. And we're working with a number of groups, including Farmers Union, who basically owns this, has led the charge uh, to get this on the map, uh, spent the resources to collect the signatures. And so we're really excited because we think that's part of our uh, trifecta uh, for reform. The second thing that we're looking at is a nonpartisan election where you know you get amendment a chance v. it's amendment v you get a chance to vote uh for the people based on their ideas and the merit of their candidacies versus always defar- defaulting to their party label uh, nebraska's had a system like this for over 80 years and it served them well they t- pay their teachers a lot better than they do here in south dakota <laughs> um matter of fact they overrode uh the republican governor's uh, vetoes of the death penalty last uh, two, a session in, uh, mm-hmm. two sessions reform. ago, immigration reform, and attacks to fix roads and bridges. And they have the and unicameral. They do have a unicameral, which is not part of this change right. that we're advocating. But one thing I thought was really fascinating is that when they go to Lincoln, Nebraska, they don't organize as red and blue, uh, or as you know the Democrat caucus and the Republican caucus. They come together as one, and then they elect the leadership. And uh, two sessions ago, um, they actually elected more Democrats to chair their uh, their state legislative committees than they did Republicans. And uh, it's you know, not that they don't have political parties. No, they no political parties are still alive and well. Yeah. But you'll get good feedback from both the Democratic chairman and the Republican chairman of how this has worked for the state of Nebraska. It's our it's our neighbor to the south, and we just think there's a good lesson to be learned here. You have a bill in the in the Nebraska state legislature. You don't have to run it through the party leader to uh, get, uh, get the and you thumbs know, up. And then, you it's know idea, what? It's more and if you're leading Schoenbeck, you don't get thrown out of caucus right. <laughs> if you disagree. <laughs> a lot, a lot <laughs> of shenanigans going well, on. Yeah, I mean, and that happens. And uh, I just think, uh, you know, and I get, I get attacked sometimes from my partisan Democrats for, for pushing this. But I just think, as I've told them, I care more about the values of my party than I do about the club I'm in. And, uh, and I think if that means we can you know, have an easier chance of raising teacher salaries, you know, dealing with our infrastructure, dealing with health care issues, then we got, I'm, I'm going to put what I, whatever credibility I have, whatever energy I have behind it to see if we can uh, make this, uh, this uh, uh, successful campaign in November. The third thing, which is part of the trifecta, uh, is a campaign finance reform, uh, government accountability, anti-corruption act. And it's extremely uh, comprehensive. We worked on this for almost eight months, uh, 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 referencing, frankly, which is something you guys are aware of because the paper covered it, the uh, Center for uh, Public Integrity's uh, report card of South Dakota. You know, for for two report cards over a four-year period of time in 2012, we were determined to be the second most at risk state for corruption and in I, South Dakota. Right. And that, that, it's always bothered me when people reference that. Not, and not that it's a bad study because I'll say this, it was potential for corruption, not, and people at have taken risk that. Of corruption. People have taken that to mean corruption. At risk of corruption, lack which of is what they lack say. Of an right. But it was talk to Denise Ross, yeah. right. talk to Seth Tupper. They've done the stories on it, they've looked into what. I understand you know, what right, it is, right. but what I'm saying is, is that got translated in many general places as being South Dakota is the second most corrupt state in the nation. Right. I don't need to answer. Well, Seth, I think the Indiana that. University study said we're we're in the top ten and, of corrupt and and states that's in the, in the we in have the horrible open records laws. Yeah. That's and that's a lot of what Talk this to comes Dave down to. He talks about it all the time. I know he does. We pay him to do that. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, so we, also basically, tangible, we also have tangible examples yep. with gear well, up. Well, I'm gonna, right. Right. I'm not, there's, I, I, you, but you, this isn't New York where people are going to jail either. There, there's not bribery in the streets. We have a serious problem in this state with transparency and with public discourse. We have a serious, serious problem. That is not the same as people on the take. You would agree with that? Yeah. No, I think that's... I would that's call it lack of transparency and accountability rather than corruption, because corruption, I mean, well, it's, it's a matter of semantics, I suppose. But I, I think what Patrick's saying is corruption brings to mind back, backdoor dealing where cash is exchanged hands between... Uh, and maybe that did happen at EB-5, quite frankly, but... 
I well, mean, I mean, I'll, I'll go into all. I mean, you know, I was so funny during the campaign, if you want to go back, uh, you know, to 2014, all you heard coming out of here was, well, no, we've taken care of that. We've looked at that. You know, the, the attorney generals looked at it. The uh, the over, uh, uh, legislative oversight uh, uh, committees looked at it. And, and uh, I remember even hearing uh, Yolt Bolin after the election saying that was nothing more than just a democratic, you know, issue raised to, you know, confuse people and, con you know, uh, focus uh, the state on this problem that doesn't exist. Well, you know, just recently you had Yolt Bolin suing the state. You had the state suing Yolt Bolin. You had all these Chinese investors uh, suing both the state and Yolt Bolin. Mm -hmm. No, it's then, all good. And, 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 then, and then you have the, the federal government saying, you so mismanaged and screwed up that program, we're gonna, you're no longer eligible. So don't tell me that they took a serious look at it, because they didn't. Well, we, did, we took a serious well, look you, at yeah, it. Yeah, you did, and you wrote and about we, it. We yeah. were the ones in the early days of that uh, controversy that exposed all the connections between the Chinese investors, the offshore accounts, all of that. So it, it clearly wasn't a Democratic Party thing. And I, anybody who says that's wrong, and Yope is clearly trying to the only guy who really knows all the answers is dead. Yeah, unfortunately, that's and, true. Uh, uh, and it's easy to blame a dead man. But that's a clear, I think that that, was, that is a clear example of, uh, of you, corruption? you can call it corruption, right. But there, there, are, there are not that many examples of that. And I think that the great mistake in EB-5 wasn't payoffs. It was just complete lack of supervision. Well, I think there was one big payoff that was very tr uh, troublesome and problematic, and that's when Richard Benda went to, uh, up, up to the plan in, uh, in Aberdeen and delivered a million dollar check and, and left with a half a million dollar uh, agreement, you know, for two years of processing and the, the, visas. The, the now, problem with that was that you, they let Benda, yes. Uh, ben, th that notion of Benda leaving government one day and working for a guy who used to work for him the next day was wrong, and I, I don't mind calling that. Now corruption. is that corruption? That's but that's a, that's a complete lack of super. People turned a blind eye to that because there's no prohibition against that in state law. There should be. There should be. And there I think that's one of the reasons yep. we get hammered by that national nonpartisan group on our being at risk of corruption. Well, you know, and the other and Mike Brown sat in this room, and I asked him when you talked to Benda. When he said he was leaving, the, did, did you ask him what he, he was going to be doing? And Ron said, no. He just said he had a job. I think that was, that's an example of uh, error, an error of omission. Let's just call it that. By not asking the question, you're not, he, he not asked the question because he didn't want to know. Well, yeah, I mean, I, you know, that's, that's, Water under the bridge or over right. the bridge. Right, but that I is, mean, that is but, one of the but, great examples. It's probably the best so, example. So of part of this, this government what, accountability and anti-corruption act uh, would create an ethics mm -hmm. commission. And there I used you know, to be an ethics commission. There used to be. In 1979, it was, uh, it, uh, I think it went away. Uh, it was in, in force for about a year. I believe uh, a good friend of mine, uh, Omer Kanderis from Rapid City, was the author. Went out after uh, Janklow came yeah, in as the first yeah, term, right? And it was gone. That's right. And I've been working with Don Frankenfeld on this particular bill. Don was actually in the legislature at the time. Uh, confessed to me when we were talking about what we needed to do that he actually voted to, to, to get rid of it. And it was a bad vote. He admitted it. We need it. So this bill creates a, a, a nonpartisan ethics commission. I think if you have something like that, we still can't get it done in peer. Mm -hmm. okay? Well, it's not going to happen. No, they, they won't deal with it. Peggy Gibson, who's been pushing it ever since she uh, got elected out of Beetle County, uh, can't get it out of the committee to the floor. It's like the minimum wage. So let's put it on the ballot and let the people decide whether or not we have a corruption you, problem or not. I would, there, are, there are examples of corruption, I would say that. But Let's talk about Gear Up. Uh, uh, gear Up is it's pretty fuzzy in terms of... I, I can't say one way or the other with Gear Up yet. I mean, I, don't, I still don't... Jack Lee's having a, uh, a conference tomorrow, press conference tomorrow. We're going to learn something new. Clearly, somebody... Somebody was at the very least lack of oversight and accountability and money flying around, federal money flying right. around without much oversight. Right. So w if that's government or if it's something acting on, in the name of government, I don't know the answer to that question yet. Mm -hmm. um, I it's don't have any evidence to suggest that there was somebody in state government in the Department of Education that was funneling money 
and benefiting from that. I don't know that. Well, I, I you know, well, you, you the, check, check, check it out. But one of the, there's so much you can read about this. Um, uh, you know, but one of the things I read that I was sort of stunned is that the Secretary of Education at the time that applied for the federal mm -hmm. grant, right, then awarded it. Uh, you know, to, to mm -hmm. you could Dick some would Melmer. say what? Yeah, yeah, Dick Melmer. Uh, then all, all of a sudden, after he leaves, he's working for him. He's working for him at you know six figure. Again, I think six, it's six six, six uh, figure income. I think it goes back to that notion of the same thing with uh, Benda that you can leave state government one day and be working for somebody benefiting from that position the next. Yes. That that is, is well, an ethical issue that needs to be addressed. The Government Accountability and Anti Corruption Act addresses that. Here's my question okay. for you: You have several things tied up in that third one. Yeah. Um, do you think that, are you worried at all that the, the public financing part of that, which was going to be seem the most uh, uh, radical to a lot of people, is going to overshadow the rest of it? Meaning, you've got these reform pieces in there, and then this financing thing, and financing is always the bugger. Well, you know, I ran on a, on a platform uh, of money and, you know, trying to figure out how to dilute the money in politics so that people could get elected and do right by their constituents, not by their uh, big donors and, and the special interests that you know seem to have a grip on anybody that runs for public office. And then when they get there, it's just sort of it's like legal bribery, right? I mean, it's just you know I'll I'll, I'll give you money and but I need help on this bill or that. And uh, you know, if 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 we can figure out a way, and we attempt to do that in this legislation. To use our own, ta I mean, these are my tax dollars too, right? Mm -hmm. And we're talking about these democracy credits where you give a couple hundred bucks to invest in candidates um, that you want to support. Mm -hmm. What it does, it has an impact on uh, diluting uh, the impact that uh, the big check writers have and the, the uh, dependency of the candidate. And the easiest path is to go to the people that can write you a thousand dollar check versus the person that's going to give you a fifty dollar democracy credit. And you know, and for a few hundred dollars of my tax dollars, I think it's a pretty good deal. I think it 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 gets people invested in in uh, this political process, which I think is 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 to this day uh, remains rigged and in favor of people that have, uh, c call it investment income, discretionary <laughs> income, whatever you want to call it, but they've got disposable income to, uh, to uh, uh, basically uh, own the system. Or a rich and we have to change it. Or a rich it is, team. it is. Not, most people don't contribute uh, to, to, to uh, politics. They just, they don't have the income to do it and they don't think it would make a difference because people writing those thousand dollar five thousand dollar checks the part of that campaign finance reform thing too people don't know this so if you're sitting as governor of the state of south dakota right now and you're not going to run again and you got two or three million dollars in your account and when you got elected last time you maybe decided you weren't going to run again but you were in a position to raise money because you might run again for something right mm -hmm. you can take every dime that's in that committee and call it personal income if pay taxes on yeah but that's what you do. You, you ride off into the sunset, you got three. There's your retirement, you know? So you can do that. It closes that down. I think if most people in South Dakota knew that, they'd be outraged. That's at the state level. That's at the state level. You can't do that at the federal level. And you can take your, can you take your state money and move it to a federal campaign and not the other way around? How does that work? No, it's the federal money you can take to a state campaign, but not your state money to a federal right. campaign. To, be, to Patrick's question, I mean, is, it, is it too sweeping? I mean, it, it's a very ambitious, just, uh, just talking about initiated measure 22, the anti-corruption one, it's a very sweeping measure. Uh, would it have been made more sense just to focus in on getting the ex ethics commission in place and, and deal with, with that element of it rather than trying to kind of capture it all with the uh, campaign credits? And well, I, I think uh, that remains to be seen. I, I think there's a real appetite right now for change. I think there's a, a real anger towards the, the, uh, the establishment, the established order, both at the, the uh, state level and obviously, you know, you're seeing it at the national level. And uh, I think uh, people in South Dakota have had a, a steady diet of EB-5 and, and uh, gear up mm -hmm. and, um, you know, even the little snafu in the Secretary of State's office, and we're going to have Chantel on here uh, talk. I, I imagine you'll ask her about what, you know, what happened She'll really with the flag and the, the up, laptops yeah. and how she's cleaned <laughs> it all. But, you know, when you have the kind of just dominance in peer 
There isn't real check up, checks and balances. Let's go to that. There's no, now. you know, an ethics commission would be a huge improvement it would because be. you would have it, it. Just you learn this in a business, you know. Mm -hmm. You do, you don't allow your employees to steal. You you put in safeguards, you know. I mean, every good business does that. We don't have that, you know, in in Pierce, South Dakota, in our state capital. I think that the, the lack of ethics commission is just endemic of this notion that you don't need to know, and we fight that every single day. Trust me. And the transparency and uh, digging in further to the open records law is a great discussion to have. And I think that part of, part of why I push back against that word corruption is like you push back against the word fascism. Like, be, be, corruption uh, implies that it's a criminal act. And what I think we have is at some level more insidious, and that is a notion of secrecy, an expectation of secrecy. And that is the culture that we have developed in this state over decades. So I think that those, that discussion of ethics commissions and transparency, that's, that is urgent because of what we've seen. But to go out and say that, that Mike Rounds is responsible for that's, he Mike Rounds lived under the system that he was given and the expectation of the people of South Dakota. And I think that the huge challenge you have and that we have been trying to do as an institution is to train, change that conversation. Whether that's Republican, Democrat, I don't care. Um, but the notion that you have to have open government for it to work properly, because then things like corruption, uh, influence Corru peddling yeah. can, can happen. Call it corruption or incompetence. Okay, you know, I mean, sometimes it's a little bit of both. Right, okay. And you know, that's and the exact reason they don't want to have those laws or commissions in place because then they can do those things now without breaking the law, essentially. If you have a, a one thing needs to be discussed, so what is the Ethics Commission going to consist of and, uh, and how broad are its power is going to be? I mean, uh, is that something that's going to be laid out or is that something that's determined if this measure passes? Well, it, you know, the, um, you know it's, a, it's a very uh, equal, three, three Democrats, three Republicans, three independents uh, appointed by the election board. Um, it's uh, modeled somewhat uh, after what we used to have back in, uh, in uh, 79. And uh, we looked around the country for best practices. Uh, uh, you know, Iowa's had an ethics commission. Uh, sometimes it's good to look uh, by, uh, close to your neighboring states and really took the, the, what we thought were the best ideas and turned it into the that South Dakota. Yeah, it, it does. They got, it's got to have authority, and it will. And, um, you know, uh, but it's just... It's just one of many things that we're trying to deal with in that bill. But you know, going back to what you said earlier, is it too much? I don't, I don't think so, uh, especially uh, at this time, I think, in our, in our, in our politics, where I, I believe, and it's the reason I think Sanders is, is doing a lot better than anybody expected, and frankly, Trump is doing a, uh, you know, a lot better than anybody expected, is that people have almost given up in, in some respects on their political institutions. You know, whether it's Pierre, Lincoln, Nebraska, or, or uh, uh, Washington, D.C., uh, they're frustrated. And, uh, and you're seeing that play out in, uh, you know, 10, 15,000 people showing up these rallies and, you know, starting to throw some punches. And it's a sad comment uh, on where we're at. I, I thoroughly uh, enjoyed my campaign. Uh, despite its <laughs> its outcome, because I was out there talking to people just one on one in every town in South Dakota, and I really left feeling okay. If you can if you can really create this real connection between the voter and the aspiring you know politician, um, you know you can restore people's faith in the process. Uh, but money's a big problem, and it's a big problem. That's why we address it. Um, the lack of accountability is a big problem, and and the uh, Government Accountability Act uh, uh, addresses that. Um, and you know, and then you have to put safeguards in there where, you know, instead of maybe one year before you can go out and cut yourself a sweetheart deal, or you know, six months, it's two years. You know, where the revolving doors, you know, is pushed out a little bit further. So it's not a quid pro quo. I give you a million bucks. I want a half a million dollars to get you some more EB-5 money. You know, that, that is part of this. And my, uh, my, my guess is, is all of those things are going to trump this little uh, uh, 
campaign finance piece. <laughs> the little campaign <laughs> finance piece. Yeah, I mean, because okay. it's really in, in comparison to all these things that are going on in so South Dakota. So would you say this is this is a, this is really a small price to pay? So what I'm hearing is your strategy is to sneak this campaign finance thing under the under the conversation of the controversial conversation about EB5 and. Uh, well, I don't think. <laughs> no, I mean, I don't think you can sneak it in. I mean, it you know it'll be a healthy debate because you know you what the other not side. To put in the Attorney General's explanation. To yeah, yeah. It's gonna be the, you, you know, you know, if there's any opposition to do this, they're not going to talk about government accountability, and they're not going to talk about corruption. They're going to talk, right? about, they're going to talk about this, you know, and that's the, that's where they're going to want to have the debate. But see, that, now you've given them a hammer in a in a in a, uh, a, com, in a in a really good discussion about how open and, and transparent government should be to prevent abuse of power. There's this. Oh, by the way, they just want to take your taxes. Yeah. Right. Well, maybe they fight that so tenaciously. They so focus on that, you sneak in the gerrymandering and the uh, nonpartisan <laughs> front. Listen, all, all of these three, uh, and there are going to be others on the ballot that we've actually worked on. I mean, for, for the legislature last session, not this session, to take that minimum wage uh, uh, initiative that passed with 55% of the voters. Mm -hmm. And amend it. And amend it. <laughs> and, and to throw it back and say, well, you really didn't mean young adults, did you? And so they change it. Mm -hmm. You know, we got into the streets with TakeItBack.org and the South Dakota Democratic Party and some other organizations, uh, 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 Oregon's Labor, and said, you know what, we're going to refer that bill. And we did. We collected enough signatures to refer it. It didn't go into effect last July. And now the voters can tell uh, Pierre what they meant again for the second time. And I also know that there have been efforts in Pierre to change the, this whole uh, initiative process. Um, you know, from how many signatures you need to, to actually collect mm -hmm. to make it more difficult. It's pretty uh, hard now. It it's is. Not, it, it, I listen, it was a very stressful year trying to get um, what we got Unless on the you're ballot. willing to pay a bunch of money to have yeah. paid. And we paid. had to raise a bunch of money. Yeah. We partnered with some national organizations. Now, the, amendments, the, resources. The, the amendments are more difficult for them to overturn than the initiative right. measures, right. correct? So right. right. And they're more difficult to get on the ballot. Yep. More so you have to strategize which way to attack each one of these things? Or? Yeah, I mean, it's... Uh, um, uh, Whether it's going to be an amendment. So which ones are the amendments? The amendment. amendments are T and V. They're letters. So the yep. gerrymandering and the nonpartisan primary. Yeah, right. gotcha. And then the other one is just an initiative. It's an issue measure uh, number 22. And we're saying vote yes on TV 22. <laughs> Did you hear that? <laughs> 22. Vote yes on TV okay. 22. Here's my question: Are you guys basically the new Democratic Party? No, I don't, I don't think so. Have at you all. just you reached that you're going to scrape it? You're not going to be able to do it through the, uh, the it's a, traditional political process. So now we're going to we're going to change things and attack the Republican uh, stranglehold via that's the, straight that, to the ballot. That's what I hear. You know, that's the sort of quote sour grapes that you you, you referenced in the article you did uh, last week, which I thought was a very good, uh, very objective uh, piece of journalism. Um, no, I don't think so at all. And uh, and, and here's why, um, and I said it earlier, I'm more interested in the values um, of my party than I am uh, you know, building the club house, okay? And when I look at um, people like, uh, and I, you could talk about Mike Huther here in Sioux Falls or uh, Paul Elward, who's the mayor in here. In, uh, uh, Paul was uh, head of the uh, uh, American Federation of County and State Municipal Employees, asked me for mm -hmm. years, I've known him. A, a strong union guy, right, runs for mayor of Huron and wins. Okay, why? Because it was probably a nonpartisan election, yeah. um, and he was know. also he was also involved in democratic politics um, as a union member. Uh, Richie Nordstrom uh, sits on the Rapid City City Council. Uh, also, a member of AFSCME and the very only Democrat in all yes. of West River, South Dakota. And you know, <laughs> and he ran for the legislature last year, thinking if he had won, you know, yep. at that city council level, he could get elected. And I and I and I say to my Democratic friends, you know, I know Richie well enough. I I, I worked for Tom Dash out there in the in the early '80s, and I've known Richie for years. You know, every vote he probably makes as a city council member, it, it can't help but go through that lens of of his union mm -hmm. and his party, right? right? And, uh, and he gets elected, and people love him out there. And he does a really good job. He runs for the legislature, and he doesn't do so well. Um, that's what they've done down in, in uh, Lincoln, Nebraska. It's no longer about having you know, to carry the party's uh, you know, water or platform. It's, it's representing the voters. And I think that's what we need to get to in this country. You know, take, take everything that we're talking about 
and take it out nationally. I think Washington is so screwed up because the red states and the blue states have gerrymandered their states to the point where, you know, there's no incentive um, to compromise. There's no incentive, incentive uh, you know, to find solutions. The incentive is be as extreme as you can be because it's feeding that, that base within your district. So if we start changing it state by state, which is what our national ambition is as an organization, if we're successful here in South Dakota, uh, of all states with these efforts, we can then uh, export this idea about using, at least in the 23 other states that are out there, mm -hmm. exporting this idea that, you know what, nothing's going to change in Washington. It just ain't going to change. Not at least for the next four or five elections. I don't see the but House still flipping. Gonna be, there are still going to be political parties. Yes. And I don't, in it's South not Dakota, are you not concerned about the state of your party? I mean, I know some people accuse you of <laughs> throwing in the towel. Uh, would you? Would it be better served to use your your considerable weight and tr reputation to try to help the Democratic Party in South Dakota, or do you feel like that's almost a waste of time at this point, and the ballot situation yeah, these, is the way to go? You know, these things come and go. I, I think they're cyclical. We're, you know, the Democratic Party uh, obviously. It's not the party it was in the in the 70s, uh, 80s, or even uh, even the the, the early 90s. Um, you know, it's it's changed. I was in Pierre a couple weeks ago. I mean, we have 20, I think, legislators out of 105. I don't think I've ever seen it at that level in my lifetime. It's pretty bad. And uh, you know, and I, I I hear out there rumblings, even on the other side. Some of the more thoughtful uh, Republicans are saying this isn't healthy for democracy. You know, we well, need the other a, a side battle. Saying that, you know, you got a problem. Yeah, we need a battle in exchange of ideas here, uh, because we'll get better public policy. Well, the problem is that the debate happens behind closed doors. Yeah. Well, you can have the uh, issues get decided in the Republican caucus. Well, in West River, the gen the primary is the general election. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let me ask you this: though. I don't mean to beat this to death about the new Democratic Party, um, but it seems like the real energy in the public debate in South Dakota is in among not the Democratic Party, but in your organization with Steve Hildebrand's effort with Steve Hickey. Um, these are monumental questions, right? I mean, these are the big ideas of the day. Whether or not you win, I don't, that's, that's up for people to figure out. But, you know, putting these things to the, to the public is going to drive a discussion about transparency, corruption, whatever you want to call it, and it's going to drive discussions about predatory lending. And these are, these are big ideas. These ideas are not coming out of the party, or at least they're not getting them into the public sphere. Yeah, but you know, I will, I'll give the Democratic Party credit for uh, advancing the minimum wage uh, two years ago. That mm -hmm. was a party-driven effort. We mm -hmm. just jumped on because I had people out in the field collecting signatures from my own nominating petitions. Um, you know, so I mean, give them a win. I mean, they did that, you know. Uh, it wouldn't have happened without it. How come they can't win at the polls, uh, at the, in, in the individual races? Well, How come they can't have candidates? They can't recruit candidates. Well, part of it, I mean, you know, someone approached me about running for the legislature mm -hmm. in District 13. Well, you know, I mean, first of all, I'm just, I'm done with elect elective uh, politics. Um, but, you know, when you've got such a lopsided district, I mean, what's the point? Right. You know, you, I mean, you, you, you know, you, people go in, and a lot of times when it comes to these legislative uh, candidates, they just default to the to the party that they they're registered in because they unfortunately don't uh, do their homework. My mom says it all the time: people need to do their homework, <laughs> and uh, it's hard. But you know, I actually think a nonpartisan primary people is going to require them to, more homework being to do more homework. You can't just click R or D. You got right. Well, they have to go there. Who is this person? Right, and it and it makes the candidate. Uh, it forces the candidate to reach out to both sides. Republicans, independents, and Democrats, which I think is a good way to start that dialogue again, especially if they get elected, you know, because they've reached out to the Democrats, they've reached out to the Republicans and the independents. You know, the other thing that doesn't make any sense in South Dakota, and this would change that, is that, you know, the Democrats did open up their primary mm -hmm. to independents, but the Republicans didn't. Mm -hmm. So Republic probably should. Republicans, uh, uh, independents cannot participate 
in the Republican. Rick Novi is not happy about that. No, he's not. And Rick is one of our co I mean, he is the, he's chairman of the ballot committee that we put together for this thing. And that's just not right. You know, think about it. And, and these two parties in their elections are being subsidized by the taxpayers. If you're a registered independent, which you probably are, guys, because you're in the newspaper business, you're subsidizing the two political parties and their platforms and all the stuff that goes with it. And, uh, you know, do you think that that is fair as an independent, that you don't even get a chance to participate? In fact, uh, if you're not just getting candidates on the ballot, if you're not part of the two-party system, you're the bar for signatures and that sort of thing is troublesome. Well, in, they, they also passed the bill last year, not this last session, mm -hmm. but SB69, uh, SB that all of a sudden now, because we had Senator Pressler running and, and Gordon Howie running in that Senate race, uh, that only registered independents now can sign the nominating oh, petitions yeah. for independent you candidates. You can't be a libertarian. Yeah. You have to be registered You have as to be a registered independent. Prior to that, and, and that's been referred to. Did you know that? No, that we referred that. that as well. Okay. okay? That was the, 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 the things that we did early last year. But uh, now, um, and, and so that didn't go into effect, but if, 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 if Peer was able to get that done, without a challenge, without a referral process, it just would have made it a lot more difficult for independents to, to run because uh, it would, you know, it's just so, hard to do. So let me be clear about something. Tell me a little bit about this uh, idea of trying to bring some of these ideas to other states that have uh, 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 initiation and referral. Um, uh, that's not right, INR. Uh, the, uh, who are you partnering with? Like what national organizations are you working with? Uh, how is, this isn't just uh, Rick Weiland sitting in Sioux Falls saying, you know, if we do this here, we can do it. You have, you have conversations with other people. How do you see that coming together? Well, you know, one of the uh, things that came out of my campaign was some uh, infrastructure, some capacity to, to uh, you know, to maybe uh, focus on some other uh, things after mm -hmm. the election was over. I mean, we ended up with, uh, you know, 70 some thousand email addresses and mm -hmm. um, although election night didn't reflect what it looked like at Weiland headquarters uh, in early October, but you know, that race was tight. It was tight. And, and for a very, uh, you know, for about a week in October, I mean, you saw it out here because all the national press was all of a sudden focused on South Dakota. The numbers were turning. They were turning big time and I've gotten it from good authority on the Republican side that they were really nervous. Um, that uh, this thing was going south. And as a result of that energy, you know, we had a lot of people that uh, contributed to the campaign, that volunteered. So we have some capacity mm -hmm. as a result of that. Plus, when you're run, running for the United States Senate, it's a national race. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and, and I was able to get on some national uh, television programs, um, you know, had an opportunity to talk to a lot of national organizations that we're uh, wanting uh, to uh, uh, be helpful, and uh, like, so there's some capacity. So, so here's what here's what came out of out of the election was a was a real opportunity to reach out to national organizations like uh, Open Primaries, which is a national group now we're partnered with that has been pushing these nonpartisan election initiatives throughout the country. Um, they're the experts in the field. Um, and it's really good to, to have people, knowledgeable people, uh, that could help uh, guide us through this process. Another group called uh, Represent.us, uh, I reached out to them in November. I mean, I ran a campaign basically on money and politics, overturning Citizens United, taking back our government from big money special interests and getting to work for everyday folks again. That's that's in their wheelhouse. That's what they're focused on. And they're also focused at doing it one community at a time, one state at a time. So there are groups like that that, that are out there well, that we have been reaching out to. There'll be a lot more groups. Mm -hmm. and they'll, well, be, they'll be more adamant about it. Is this a source of financing as well? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. You bet. So that's going to help immensely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, both those groups are, are helped us get these things on the ballot. They invested, uh, you know, uh, money to do that. Within reason, of course, because we don't want to overdo the campaign finance. You don't want to be, <laughs> don't want to be heavily financed if you're going against campaign finance. Special yeah. interest financing. Yeah. Well. The, uh, the, the interesting thing about that is do you find it at some measure, I don't want, easier is not the right word, but different to organize a campaign around an idea than organize a campaign as a, as a political candidate? 
very different. That's one, that's one of the hard lessons we've learned because it's been a real struggle. Um, you know, people just, I don't know, maybe get more back from a candidate than they do from an idea. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, so I've had, to, I've had to sort of change my thinking about this a little bit. But, you know, one of the things, and I hate to say this, but, um, I, you know, candidate-driven change um, you know, I think for at least for at least for now has been parked on the sideline here. That I, you know, I don't see Washington coming to grips with a lot of these issues. It is gridlocked, it's dysfunctional, and I don't see that changing uh, overnight. Even if you know, say uh, 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 you know, uh, Hillary Clinton wins and and the Senate goes Democrat, uh, but the House isn't. Or Donald Trump wins, um, you know, in the Senate you can block just about anything, you know, if you have 40 or 50 votes. They've been votes. grappling so, with the minimum wage on a federal level, yeah. and you got it done here on a state level uh, just by taking it straight to the voters. Yeah, and one thing I do know, I do know this for a fact, is that when an office holder is threatened by losing that office, mm -hmm. they have a tendency to kind of change their way of thinking. Um, and, uh, and, our, and our hope is, you know, we're successful here. It may take a couple of cycles, but, you know, uh, several states start doing what we've done here, and Washington sees the change come. I mean, look what happened. Okay, guys, we're both old enough. Uh, all of us are old enough to know or at least have uh, memories of what happened in the 60s. And we're hearing now about the, the, the rallies in 1968 and the but I, I was 10 years old in 1968 and I, it was probably when I got most interested in politics because it was, it was like, you know, it's like now watching these Trump rallies. Every day something was happening that mm -hmm. was different. Yep. But, you know, civil rights didn't come from Washington. It came from Selma, you know. Um, Vietnam didn't shut down in Washington. It came, you know, it was Kent State, Ohio. It was what was going on in the streets in this country that got their attention. And that's what, this, that's what Take It Back org is all about. You've got to take to the streets. Take it back. <laughs> well, I mean, I, we could probably talk about this for several hours. We could. I, I didn't we know if you were uh, trying to, you're going to do the, the, the... Yeah, we need to do our wordplay thing, but I, I just, uh, I think it's fascinating. And I don't, I, you must be getting some discussion. There's a lot of discussion here. Um, uh, you know, not necessarily generally quite. It's the same discussion we're having, so I think it's... Okay. It's, it, some of it's just commentary. There was one question, uh, and this is not a bad question. Rick, you make it, this is from Scott, South Dakota. You make a good point about two years of campaigning. What planet does Jay Williams think he is in from if he thinks he has a chance against Thune jumping in only a few months before the election? I like Jay, but I'm concerned about the South Dakota Democratic Party strategies. Uh, what are your thoughts on, on uh, Mr. Williams as a former Senate candidate yourself? It is very late. Essentially, the word has always been if they couldn't find anybody else to do it, he would. Um, and are there any legitimate Democratic candidates forthcoming that you can, you think people could maybe get excited about, including statewide? Uh, is, is Huther a legitimate statewide candidate, do you think? But you can start, there are with, all kinds you can start of questions with Jay here. One. Well, you know, and I've known Jay for years, and, mm -hmm. uh, and every time I was in Yankton during my campaign, um, it was one of the most vibrant uh, uh, communities in terms of support. Uh, when I visited, and, and a lot of that had to do with Jay. He's a great organizer. He's got a lot of energy, and God bless him for stepping up and uh, in challenging uh, John. Um, it, you know, at it, it the very, you know, what we're going to have is we'll have an exchange of ideas, which I think is what this process is all about. Uh, it wasn't what six years ago we didn't run anybody. Right. You right? can't do that again. You know, and and and, and uh, you know, so I I, I wish uh, Jay well. Uh, and I really appreciate the fact that he's been willing to step up and, and take this on. It's not an easy uh, path, and, you know, I know John's got a lot of money in the bank. Uh, he's part of the Republican leadership. Um, but, you know, uh, I also think that this is a presidential year. There are a lot of people that vote in presidential elections that mm -hmm. didn't vote in 2014. Um, I think he's going to, uh, you know, uh, has the potential to surprise a few people. Other potential statewide candidates from the Democratic Party? Top three. Well, I, you know, uh, uh, you know, off the top of my head, Brendan Johnson, uh, Stephanie Herseth, uh, Mike Huther. Uh, top three. Okay. I'm not even going to challenge you on those first two because they're never going to run for anything again. Yeah. But <laughs> Mike Huther is an interesting. He he is a 
he is a uh, interesting potential candidate for the Democrats. He's somebody who they, he's clearly a Democrat, that's not the question. Um, it's whether or not uh, they can all get along. Because generally speaking, if you don't get along well, with he's got some money. He's got some money. <laughs> yep. He's got some na huge name recognition. Uh, he's got some executive skills. The problem is he rubs a lot of people the wrong way, and, he, and he's, he's going to want to run the show. guy. So, you know, there's there's some strikes there, definitely. Yeah, and I think there are other people out there. I mean, you know, Billy uh, Sutton, Sutton, who I uh, have gotten to know now in the last two or three years quite well. I mean, what a what a what a wonderful human being, uh, who has a smile on his face. Um, you know, who has lost the, the ability, uh, mm -hmm. you know, to uh, to walk, is in a wheelchair, but uh, doesn't let him, you know, get in the way of his wonderful disposition. He's a smart uh, legislator, um, well liked in his district. I mean, there are people like that out there. You know what his deal is? He's got to lose the hat. <laughs> well, because you know what comes with the hat. I love the hat. Hey, listen, I campaign with Billy, out, Billy out at Dog Days, okay, in 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 Burke, South Dakota. Dog you're gonna Days. A, you're going to need a hat. I mean, I but I it was a wonderful experience, and his mom Renee was calling the the entry uh, entries as we we're walking by, and she just let him have it out there. You know, it's a pretty conservative area. So listen. This guy's a good guy, Rick Wild, and you've got to vote for him. He's a Democrat. Don't hold it against him. He's a good guy. And she kept heading it, and Billy and I just had a great time. But there's people like Billy. Um, you know, I, I still think uh, Bernie Hanoff is one of the most, you know... Uh, he's a one, voice of reason. He is a voice of reason in the legislature. He is a statesman. Um, you, know, uh, you know, I would love to see him. Uh, I say it on the I say it on, wide office. I say uh, it on the Monday show all the time, and then I get emails that ah, quit doing that. Bernie doesn't want to hear that. No, he doesn't. Yeah, yeah. Um, but you know, and then what he's done with that South Dakota magazine is, uh, mm -hmm. I just uh, he's very well known. That's a he's Bernie's been in every town, every corner of South Dakota. There's not that many people who have his knowledge of the I'll, state. I'll, well, I'll, uh, <laughs> I ran into Bernie, and he, he was surprised he was giving a, a South Dakota Magazine little uh, presentation, I think it was in Springfield, yeah. during the campaign. And I just, I didn't know he was there. I just happened to be in Springfield that day campaigning. So I went in and sat, sat down and listened to it. It was a wonderful presentation of, of the article that was in the magazine. But a couple Democratic heavyweights in the same room. It's uh, Springfield. That's <laughs> yeah. a big deal. Yeah. Uh, all right, we better get to uh, wordplay, and we will run our opening right now. Word play. Mr. Claus, he believes in what he believes. There's some funny people there. Yeah. Do, I'm doing this for you, baby. Uh, <laughs> President Obama. <laughs> Toyotes. <laughs> Beware. <laughs> Well, you're in good company. You might be added to the opening montage. <laughs> we got to do something with the opening montage, yeah. that's for sure, because we got to get lits out of there. I say that every <laughs> single time. There's a whole lot of lits going on there. All right, are you familiar with uh, the basic rules of this game? I'm not. <laughs> uh, Is it anything like gonna, Cards Against Humanity? Yeah. <laughs> that's all I want to know. It's getting to be that way. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to throw some names and terms at you. Oh, great. And, uh, you uh, give us a knee-jerk response. One two-word response uh, that sums up your feelings on that topic. I'll try. Take it back. Take it back. org. <laughs> take it back. org. Uh, tough to summarize that one. <laughs> well, it is tough to summarize. I just say, listen, straight up, honest, um, makes sense. Tom Daschle. Um, uh, regretful, we lost him. South Dakota Democratic Party. Um, don't give up. University of South Dakota. My alma mater. Lally's with you on that one. <laughs> Mike Rounds. <laughs> you knew it was coming. <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't. <laughs> you know, I, I don't like to be uh, 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 accused of sour grapes, but, uh, you know, this, this, I have to do this in one or two words. This whole Trump comment the other day really blew me away. To, off, to, to basically say that even if he did, it, I'd still, you know, he'd still be my guy. So I think unfortunate, uh, uh, you know, uh, unfortunate. Parker's Bistro. Uh, <laughs> great place to eat. Steve Hildebrand. God bless him. Nonpartisan primaries. It's the only way. 
Donald I'm getting better at this. Yeah, you're, 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 now you're on a roll. <laughs> Starting to get a rhythm. That's right. Uh, Donald Trump. Demeaning. EB5. It's real. Mike Huther. Promise. John Thune. <laughs> it's real. <laughs> <laughs> you know... <laughs> No comment. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Uh, I, listen, <laughs> you know, I, I ran against John in '96. I think John is a is a is a good guy. Uh, I don't agree with his politics. Uh, never have, but I think he's a good politician. Uh, he's I, done well for us. He so. comes back. Um, I've hunted with him. Uh, on the trail. Yeah, and uh, you know, but um, yeah, I'll let it go at that. When you hunt with him, keep the Keep that was a long time ago, by the way. Right <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, Madison, South Dakota. Uh, family. We'll end with this one. Rick Wyland's political future. Uh, Takeitback.org. We'll not be looking beyond that. <laughs> that's quite a bit to uh, quite a bit going on with that. So uh, uh, it would be foolish to look beyond that because uh, a lot happening going up to that. Uh, November ballot, and uh, you'll be hearing a lot more about uh, TicketBack.org and the initiatives within, and uh, a very good, healthy political discourse that is stemming from that. I want to thank uh, Rick Wyland for being here and uh, taking us through much of that. I want to thank my uh, sidekick, Patrick Lally, for adding to the discussion as always, and our producer, Elisha Page. And we will see you next week with Mark Mickelson on Sufu Stew.